World War One, Unit 4, also including the Russian Revolution. So, when we start talking about World War One, an easy way to remember why it happened or what the causes were was this idea of mania. M-A-N-I-A. -A. We have all the uh, major causes of World War One sort of listed out here. Uh, using this acronym. So here we go. Militarism, alliance systems, nationalism, imperialism, and the assassination of the Archduke Francis Ferdinand. We're going to talk about each one of these uh, right now. All right, so militarism is defined as the glorification of armed strength and at the turn of the 20th century, meaning the 1800s into the 1900s, Germany and Britain were in the middle of, a, of an arms race, basically, uh, seeing who could build up the largest, most powerful navy in Europe. Um, there was also sort of a pervading sense throughout leadership circles in Europe, meaning the governments of Germany and Britain and France, that it's actually better to strike first rather than waiting to be a, a, attacked, sort of an offensive mentality. Uh, overall, there was a, a feeling that um, the defensively minded will, um, will perish as a result of their own passiveness. Um, and really, no nation really personified the idea of militarism or symbolized the idea of militarism better than Germany. Uh, Germany, um, through the leadership of the Kaiser, uh, Wilhelm II, really felt that if Germany was to make a mark in geopolitics, in, you know, leave a mark in making things happen in the world, it would be important to match the big dog on the block, so to speak, that is Great Britain, uh, in terms of their naval strength and the rest of their military strength. So leading into the early part of the 1900s and certainly up to 1914, the start of World War I, uh, that's what Germany endeavored to do. So another uh, reason here for the start of World War I was the entangling alliance systems that Europe had basically organized itself into. Alliance systems are defined as a group of nations promising to defend each other during a time of war. Um, ultimately here during World War I, Europe had divided itself into really two armed camps. Okay, we have the Central Powers, which was initially composed of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey. Um, sometimes in some readings, the Central Powers are also referred to as the Triple Alliance. Then we have the Allies, which originally was Russia, France, Britain, uh, Russia, France, and Great Britain. Um, or before the start of World War I, the Allies were referred to as the Triple Entente, and Entente really just means understanding. Um, but after the, the outbreak of hostilities in uh, August of 1914, uh, Russia, France, and Britain are known as the Allies. And uh, originally the idea behind the organization of these alliance systems was to basically preserve what was seen as a, an existing balance of power. And that just means that, you know, a nation like France felt that it was vulnerable to a nation like Germany. So France sought to ally itself with a nation like Britain uh, and Russia. And then that puts Germany in a difficult position because then you know, it has France on the western border and, you know, Russia on the eastern border. So Germany is going to look for somebody to help them out. And that's ultimately why they, they will ally with Austria-Hungary. So the, the problem with this is that if there's a dispute between any of the two countries in the alliances, meaning if there was a, like what does happen in 1914, where there was a dispute um, between... Um, Austria, Hungary, and like Russia, then what that ultimately does is it pulls all of the allies into a potential conflict. So 
a conflict that never originally even involved a country like Britain or France, uh, gets drawn into it because of these pre-existing alliance systems. Now, we've talked a great deal about nationalism this year, right? We've discussed the rise of certain nations. We've talked about it as uh, being defined as pride in your country, but also a, a desire to be led by your own kind. Uh, nationalism had a lot to do with the previous unit when we talked about imperialism. Um, and nationalism is going to be a major cause of World War I as well. It caused rivalries between France, Britain, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia. And really, it's going to be a nationalist conflict that's going to set up the, uh, the start of World War I. Okay? Specifically, and we'll get to this uh, in a few minutes, but specifically uh, a nationalist conflict inside the multi-ethnic empire uh, of Austria-Hungary. Uh, is going to be the thing that really does uh, kick off the First World War. Now there it is, imperialism. Now we just finished the unit on imperialism and we've defined imperialism as uh, the desire for one nation to dominate another nation politically, economically, and socially. Um, there was imperialism going on throughout the world in 1914 when the First World War started. Um, we saw imperialist things happening in Africa, Asia, you know, even even parts of uh, the Middle East. Um, and really, the, the big idea behind imperialism is always the desire to gain raw materials and markets, right? The desire to make money. And those competing economic interests between countries like Germany and Britain and France and Austria-Hungary are going to lead to conflict. So they'll certainly have... Uh, a big part to play in the beginning of the First World War. Um, in 1914, Germany was the fastest growing economy in Europe, and it was threatening the British economically, um, without question. So there was a great deal of concern and fear that the British felt toward when they looked at the Germans, and they saw that Germany was trying to build an empire throughout Africa and parts of the Pacific, and it, it made them nervous, frankly. It made the British very nervous. So it's, it, you know, this is just going to be one of these many factors that's not going to um, create harmony. It's going to do quite the opposite of that. So, again, imperialism, uh, the I in mania. Now, here's the biggie. This is what we sometimes refer to as the spark that started the First World War. Uh, Archduke Francis Ferdinand was the heir to the throne of Austria. Austria is a very old empire right smack in the middle of Europe, um, controlled a large, diverse groups of people, um, you know, some Christians, some Muslims, uh, some people who were Slavic, other people who, some people initially could even be considered Italian, other people inside Austria-Hungary were German. So this was a large empire with a lot of different groups of people living within it. And it was the Archduke's task when he would inherit the throne uh, to try to make all of these people work together in a, in a common political unit. Um, it wasn't going to happen, though. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with... The desire of Serbia to um, basically uh, become larger. Um, part of a group of people who considered themselves ethnically and nationally Serbian lived within the confines of the Austrian Empire. And it's going to be the desire on the part of certain nationalist groups to make a statement as to why the, the the chunk of people living inside the Austria Empire that were Serbian should be a part of the nation of Serbia. That would require uh, the Austrian Empire to kind of uh, give up that piece of territory, which Austria was not ready to do. So a particular nationalist group um, known as the Black Hand um, are going to plot an assassination against the Archduke. Uh, as a way of sending a message, not only to the Austrians, but to the world, that the Serbs will not be denied. Um, and in a, eventually, in July of 1914, um, 
that Archduke will be assassinated by uh, a young man by the name of Gavrilo Princip, who was a Serbian nationalist, and unfortunately he he and his wife are are killed while um, participating in a parade in the city of Sarajevo. Um, Austrian, the Austrian government knew right away that uh, it was a Serbian nationalist group. Uh, when Gavrilo Princip was arrested, he basically told them that he's a martyr for the cause of Serbian na nationality or nationhood. And the problem is that this Black Hand group had actually been assisted by members of the Serbian government. And ultimately what that causes is an international incident. This is a situation where one government plotted to assassinate the leader of another. So Austria makes a, a set of demands to the smaller Serbian nation saying if you don't hand over your leadership and close down your newspapers and all kinds of things um, that Austria is going to invade. Um, and it's going to really be that that chain of events in July, in the middle of the summer of 1914, that's going to kick off a chain of events that really results in uh, the start of the First World War later in that summer. So here it is. This is sort of a, an enumerated version of that chain reaction that I was just referring to. Um, after the assassination, the major nations of Europe are going to respond. Each hostile action leads to another hostile action, which is, again, what I'm kind of referring to as a, a chain reaction. Austria-Hungary blames Serbia for the murders of the Archduke and his wife, uh, and they're going to make those harsh demands. Again, hand over your leadership, close down your newspapers, things like that. Um, Serbia is not going to do it, okay? And that'll lead very quickly to Austria-Hungary declaring war on Serbia on July the 28th, 1914. Now, this is where we get involved with the alliances here, because Russia, which was a friend of Serbia, is immediately going to mobilize its forces in preparation for war against Austria-Hungary. Now, Austria-Hungary has that defensive alliance with Germany. And so Germany is going to declare war on Russia, because it mobilized its forces and was threatening to attack Austria-Hungary. You got that? It gets a little complicated, so you got to listen to this. Um, Germany will also declare war on France, okay, which was also an ally of Russia. And then, really, the thing that brings Britain into the war was the invasion of Belgium. When Germany invaded Belgium on August the 3rd, 1914, um, that basically activates a, um, a treaty that the British had signed about a century earlier, uh, guaranteeing the Belgian nation basically no Belgian neutrality. If, if Belgium, is, Belgium is invaded by any European nation, Britain is the caretaker. Britain is basically the military force that will defend Belgium. So when Germany invades Belgium on its way to France, because France is an ally of Russia, and Russia is an enemy of Austria-Hungary, which Germany is a friend of, uh, it sort of sets this chain of events into motion where all the major powers of Europe now are going to be involved in a major war over something that happened in a province of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in a little, and in a little nation called Serbia. So this really gets out of hand extremely quickly. Now, there's a lot of discussion as to whose fault it was, right? Who is to blame? What, you know, who, who started the war? And the reality is there was, there was enough blame to go around for everybody. Austria-Hungary uh, blamed Serbia. You know, you could say Serbia because the Black Hand was a nationalist group, but it also utilized terror. Um, the assassination of a political leader is, is an example of terrorism. So... You could say Serbia, you could also say Austria-Hungary because they blamed Serbia and wanted to crush the whole idea of Serbian nationalism because it sort of threatened their empire. Uh, Germany and its militaristic uh, Kaiser, or King Wilhelm II, who had been building up that navy and army for years and years, you know, a lot of people feel, well, maybe Germany just wanted to use its military because it had such a strong one, and it maybe it was using these events just as a uh, an excuse to go to war, right? So Germany outwardly said, well, we just have to stand behind our ally. But some people would also say, eh, Germany 
might have been very aggressive. Who knows? Um, Russia, again, Russia gets involved in something that really didn't involve it. Russia being, uh, um, you know, a Slavic nation claimed that it was helping the Serbs and other Slavic people. Um, so that could be a reason, that could be a part of the blame. France was certainly uh, very wary of Germany and how powerful Germany had grown in the previous generation. So French, the French might have seen this as a, a way to sort of, you know, attack Germany and knock it out while they still could. And then, you know, Britain also had a lot of economic fear of the Germans. Remember, Germany was the fastest growing economy during this period. And there was a lot of fear throughout Britain that perhaps Germany would supplant Britain as the primary economic power in Europe. So maybe going to war against Germany was a way to stop that. So there's certainly enough blame to go around as to why the First World War started. It certainly didn't fall on any one particular nation. And that's important because at the end of the First World War, when we talk about the Treaty of Versailles, we'll see that blame ultimately is going to be assigned to one nation. And we'll see what the results of that are when we get there. Now, World War I would be the most destructive war in human history. Uh, some people thought that a war could never equal the magnitude of destruction that the First World War um, unleashed. And unfortunately, humanity wouldn't have to wait more than 19 years before an even more destructive war would visit Europe. And we'll talk about that in a month or so. Um, a great majority of the fighting uh, between Britain and France on one side and Germany on the other occurred on the Western Front, which was a 600-mile stretch from the English Channel to Switzerland. Um, and this is going to be an example of, of a very kind of stagnant situation where there's very little movement on either side for many years. Uh, so armies will basically face off you know, the Britain, uh, the British and the French on one side, the Germans on the other. They'll basically stay in the same spot along this Western Front uh, for about four years uh, until 1918. Um, initially, the war gets started. The Germans kind of run through Belgium and attack France on their way to Paris. Uh, and it looks very quick. It looks very much like the Germans are going to conquer Paris and win the war. Uh, within a couple of weeks of the beginning of hostilities in August of 1914. Um, but with the arrival of the British Expeditionary Force, um, which is basically a British army there to help the French allies, uh, they're able to stop the Germans before they get to Paris. And it's going to be at that point, really in the fall uh, of 1914, where this Western Front sort of settles in uh, and takes shape. And unfortunately for the world, uh, the Western Front shape is not going to change very dramatically for the next four years. Uh, the Schlieffen Plan was a plan of Germany to avoid a two-front war. Now remember, if you're looking at a map of Europe, you see Germany is in between Russia and France. France to the west, Russia to the east. Um, von Schlieffen, a German official that lived in the 1800s, was very concerned with the idea that in a future war, Germany could be encircled by allies. And that was exactly what the French, French wanted to do by allying with Russia. The idea was if France allies with Russia, that would mean Germany would have to fight a two front war, a war in the West and a war in the East. So von Schlieffen, who was a military planner, um, a strategist, really strategist, um, he had a plan to avoid a two-front war. He basically believed that Russia was so gigantic and large that it would take so long for the Russians to actually get their troops to the front to fight against Germany in the east that while the Russians were mobilizing, the Germans could swing into France with a huge right wing of their army and sort of encircle and envelop Paris, taking over France and beating the French army. And then... By the time the Russian military actually mobilized along Germany's eastern border, uh, the Germans could have uh, the armies that had already been victorious in the west sort of meet them head on. Um, ultimately, this, this plan failed uh, because the British and the French were able to repel that strong German right wing, 
and you know Schlieffen, von Schlieffen and the other German uh, military planners worst nightmares really come true here in the First World War because they are forced to fight a two-front war a war between Britain and France in the West and a war against uh, Russia in the East now almost all of World War one particularly in the Western Front was uh, an example of trench warfare uh, the idea is troops are going to dig trenches along the front. Um, these trenches will become very, very elaborate and sophisticated. Uh, they'll be reinforced with con concrete and barbed wire and um, machine gun emplacements that, that stay in one place. So again, the, the, these trenches become fairly permanent. Um, and if you think about it logically, if you're if you're digging in it means you're planning to stay and that's really the nature of the war on the western front during world war one neither side really was able to get a, a strategic or a tactical advantage over the other side so what they basically do is they just dig in uh, and try uh, with very little success over the next four years to just blow each other out of existence blow each other the smithereens to try to destroy um, the opposing trench uh, if you look at the little map here to the right you could see the soldiers sort of charging across that cratered area it sort of looks like Swiss cheese or the surface of the moon that's known as no man's land because that's basically the region between the two uh, sides trenches so if we're looking at those little men on the left there running over the surface of the moon um, we'll call them the French they're running towards the barbed wire lines of the Germans um, and what would happen is because those men running across no man's land were so exposed and so vulnerable very often by the time they reached the enemy lines they had been you know nine out of ten of them had been cut down and killed uh, so they couldn't really hope to take over uh, the enemy's trenches and that's really it goes that way on both sides both ways the uh, offensively neither side from 1914 until the spring of 1918 neither side could really get um, a tactical advantage over the other But World War I did see uh, a lot of new air and sea weapons. Um, World War I is the first to make use of modern technology and machinery. Um, and we see all kinds of examples. The automatic machine gun, the tank, the submarine, the airplane, the poison gas, and gas masks uh, were all attempts to start try to break the stalemate that had fallen across um, Europe and that Western Front. Any advantage either side thought they could get from any kind of uh, new technology was put into play um, with varying degrees of success. World War I is also the first clear example. It's not, it's not really the first example of total war in human history, but it's, it's certainly the, the, the earliest gigantic example. You could also say the American Civil War is an example of total war too, but this is the first sort of international total war and what that really means is all the nation's resources go into the war effort that means people at home are affected by the war as well as the soldiers out on the battlefield um, you have mandatory drafts where the government uh, basically forced people to fight in the army um, the government is very involved in regulating the economy during this war uh, remember fighting wars cost money um, money for everything from ammunition to uniforms to everything that goes into fighting and that necessitates the raising of taxes and the borrowing of money to pay for the war um, there's also going to be rationing that goes on at home uh, that means that uh, the production of food um, would be geared towards providing for the men in the field so civilians could only buy a limited amount of certain kinds of foods um, you're also going to see widespread propaganda on the right here you see Uncle Sam on the bottom that's an example of uh, spreading ideas to promote a cause or to damage an opposing cause governments become extremely uh, involved in the spreading of propaganda in all of the print media um, newspapers and things like that um, that's really a uh, very 20th century sort of idea um, 
and you have some examples here to the side of propaganda from all the major nations, from France to Germany to the United States, who, by the way, the United States was not involved in World War I until 1917, but I did put Uncle Sam there so that you could just get the idea. Um, and again, women at home are going to take the jobs that soldiers leave behind, um, particularly because manufacturing became so important during the First World War. It's going to be extremely important for women to sort of, um, for lack of a better term, important for women to man the assembly lines to make sure that um, all of the vehicles and the weapons are produced for the men in the field. So women are going to certainly step up in the First World War um, and make, and, and this is true for women in all the involved nations from Germany to France to the United States and Russia. Um, some will even join the army, some will go as nurses, and many of them will work on the home front. Now, unrestricted submarine warfare is going to be the major thing that helps to bring the United States into World War I. Um, Britain, as always, ha had a very strong navy, and they're going to try to do to Germany just what they had done to Napoleon about 100 years earlier. They're going to try to surround Germany and cut off, we're using their navy, and cut off anything from going into or coming out. If a nation can't trade, a nation will basically be choked to death. And that's what the British are going to endeavor to do to Germany. Now, Germany, however, by 1914 had build up, built up a very sizable fleet of submarines, which were a new technology. Um, actually, submarines have been around for a long time by this point, but the, this, World War I is the first time that fleets of them are being used uh, to turn the tide of war. Um, so what Germany's going to do is they're basically going to use their submarine fleet to set up a blockade of Britain. So Britain's going to try to blockade Germany with its battleships, and Germany's going to use their subs, and as it turns out, um, submarine warfare is going to be pretty dangerously decisive uh, for the Germans. And what that basically means is the Germans are going to basically lay in, lie in wait around the British Isles. They'll stay submerged until a ship appears, they'll surface, fire their tor torpedoes, sink the ship. And they'll do this time and time again until hundreds of thousands of tonnage of British cargo is going to go to the bottom of the sea. Um, and if Britain can't, because Britain is an island and completely dependent upon international trade, if none of that trade, if none of that food stuff, if none of the weapons are getting into Britain, then Britain's going to lose the war. And that then Germany knew it. Um, and Germany had made an announcement to the world, basically, that if you're, you're sailing in a ship... Um, approaching the British Isles, whether you're uh, a neutral country or not, uh, you can expect to be attacked. Um, this violates a principle called freedom of the seas. And this is going to be a thing that really, really, really um, is going to turn the opinion of the American people decisively against Germany. Uh, the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915 is going to be one example of this, but the United States doesn't get involved for another couple of years because what actually happens is Germany basically says, we're going to sink everything going into Britain, and then they're going to backtrack and say, okay, we won't. And then as soon as Germany, a year or so later, feels that it, it needs to keep going on that program to, to reinstitute this, con this idea of unrestricted submarine warfare, they're going to do it, and, and it's going to be then, in 1917, that uh, President Woodrow Wilson of the United States is going to ask for a declaration of war against Germany. Now, um, there's a lot of important events that happened that changed the course of the war. Um, two of them here are that uh, are the entry of the United States and the withdrawal of Russia from the war for completely different reasons. Now. Again, the United States gets involved largely, um, you know, largely because of unrestricted submarine warfare, which Germany had promised to stop via the Sussex Pledge. Um, however, uh, Germany, it, it was too important um, and too valuable a way to, to get to Britain for the Germans for them to stop doing it for long. So they will keep doing it. And Germany understands that this is going to be something that gets the United States against them. 
So they issue something called the Zimmermann note. And what this is, this is a, a basically a message from the German government to the Mexican government uh, promising Mexico if they if they attack the southern border of the United States uh, that Mexico will be awarded uh, certain pieces of American territory in the ensuing peace. If they help Germany now, Germany will help Mexico later is basically the idea. Uh, this was a coded transmission that was actually intercepted by the British. The British very quickly handed it over to the American government because they understood that this would be an outrageous thing if made public, and it was made public, and the American people basically went crazy. Who were the Germans to, you know, basically promise American territory to Mexico and all these things. So um, that combined with the reinstitution of unrestricted submarine warfare, um, that's really going to get the United States to declare war on April the 6th, 1917, on the side of Britain and France. And that doesn't come a moment too soon for Britain and France, because Germany had sort of single-handedly beaten Russia into submission on the Eastern Front, and Germany was just then really getting ready to turn all of its forces. Now Germany was no longer going to be, after three years, Germany was no longer going to be fighting a two-front war. They were going to now be able to turn their forces that they had just used to defeat the Russians in the East, they were going to turn those forces against the British and the French in the West. So it's actually pretty important to uh, Britain and France that the United States allied with them at that time, because it sort of uh, gives them a decisive, decisive advantage over Germany right when Germany thought they were gaining a decisive advantage. Um, and a major reason for the Russian withdrawal from World War I was that it had been single-handedly destroyed by Germany in battle. Hundreds of thousands of troops had been taken prisoner in addition to large uh, casualties. Um, and also, uh, Russia had started, um, had become involved in a political revolution. Uh, initially in the spring of 1917, but then it really comes to a head in October, November of 1917. Um, this is the Bolshevik Revolution, the Communist Revolution in Russia, which we will be talking about shortly. Um, so what Russia does is, under the leadership of the communists, Vladimir Lenin signs a treaty called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, and that takes uh, gives a large chunk of Russian territory to Germany. Uh, in exchange for peace for Russia, which is what uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks or the communists really needed at that time. Um, so again, the entry of the U.S. and Russian withdrawal from the war are two major turning points of World War I. Um, eventually, the war does end. Um, we see the armistice, uh, armistice signed in, on November the 11th, 1918. Um, this was an agreement to end fighting. This is not a peace treaty. This is just an agreement to end fighting while a peace treaty could be sort of hammered out. Uh, eight and a half million dead, 17 million wounded. Uh, and like I said earlier, this was the, the most destructive conflict in human history. Farms, factories, and homes were destroyed across Europe. Huge war debts uh, were accumulated. And eventually, through the treaty that is going to eventually be signed, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Nations that had been a part of the uh, Central Powers are going to have to pay reparations, which is payments for the damage th that the victorious powers um, decide that they caused. Now, this is an important one. I would tell you to put a little star next to this slide because this is something we're going to come back to in, in the ensuing units that follow this. But the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 really sticks it to the Germans, okay? Um, Germany, basically, um, France and Britain um, really forge uh, or hammer out a, a very sort of ving vindictive treaty here, basically blaming Germany for starting the war. And then like we saw earlier, there's certainly enough blame to go around for everybody here, but because Germany's sort of at the losing end of this thing, uh, they're going to be made to pay, and they're going to lose large amounts of territory uh, in the west of their country, part of the uh, country called the Rhineland, which sort of borders between France and Germany. It's sort of supposed to be like a buffer zone for the French. Um, and then also, uh, you can see in the map there, parts of Prussia are going to be basically uh, cut off 
and made part of a new nation uh, that's going to be created here, Poland. Um, so East Prussia is actually going to be separated from the rest of Germany, and that's going to be humiliating for the Germans. Um, there's going to be a clause put into this treaty called the War Guilt Clause. Like I said earlier, Germany is going to be uh, assigned the blame for starting the war. Um, Germany is going to be made to pay tremendous amount of reparations, war costs, basically, to the victorious powers. Um, now, the United States was a part of the uh, the beginning of the Peace of uh, or the Treaty of Versailles, particularly the work of Woodrow Wilson. Um, although the, the vindictive nature of the Treaty of Versailles was not really the, the American president's doing. He sort of was unable to convince his British and French allies to be a little more um, foresightful uh, in, in treating Germany. The, I think Wilson understood that, you know, if you, if you make Germany accept a harsh peace, that's just going to come back and bite you later. Um, originally, Wilson's plan for peace had included all kinds of idealistic things, including, you know, national determination. Nations should be able to de determine whatever their government is. Nations, should, you know, we have to have freedom of the seas, all of this kind of nice stuff. The only thing that really gets into it, the, uh, another thing Wilson didn't, you know, let's get rid of imperialism. Britain and France would never stand for that, though. But one of the things that actually does get into the treaty is the creation of what's called a League of Nations, okay? And that's supposed to be a group of nations that work together uh, to discuss potential problems before war breaks out. Um, Ultimately, the U.S. never joins it. Britain and France do. Even Germany does. Um, they do join this international organization, which turns out to be pretty unsuccessful, but it does sort of serve as a um, progenitor of the U.N., the United Nations, which is created after World War II. Um, but the United States isn't going to join the League of Nations because the Congress basically thought that it was going to take away some of American independence, that the United States would be continually being sucked into uh, European affairs. And really, by the end of World War I, by 1919, a lot of American lawmakers and American citizens, for that matter, had really begun to wonder why they had gotten involved in this war at all. Nothing particularly good seemed to come out of it uh, for America, and a lot of young men had lost their lives, and things of that nature. So th there's going to be an overwhelming desire on the part of the American public to go back to isolationism, stay out of European affairs, because nothing good comes out of Europe is the idea. So the U.S. never joins the League of Nations, but the idea is put out there, and it's, you know, it's kind of an idea that it was probably a bit ahead of its time. Um, so the Treaty of Versailles embarrasses Germany, it destroys the German economy. It probably even has something to do with the start of the Depression, um, because the German economy was important to how Europe functioned. Uh, and if the German economy doesn't do well, then the European economy as a whole probably isn't going to do so well. So Treaty of Versailles is an example of, uh, of a treaty that has far-reaching consequences, um, and certainly when you start talking about or thinking about the beginning of World War II, which started in 1939, you could say the groundwork for the start of World War II was certainly laid in 1918-1919 with the Treaty of Versailles. A couple other things happened as a result of World War I. One is the breakup of, you're going to see the end of a lot of these large national uh, multinational empires. You're going to see the end of the Ottoman Empire, which had fought on the side of Austria, and which also breaks up and is broken up into a number of smaller nations. The same thing happens with the Ottoman Empire. Um, what's going to happen to uh, certain possessions like Arabia, Syria, Palestine, they're going to become what's called mandates, controlled by Britain and France. Um, the idea behind mandates is that over time, they're supposed to be given independence uh, as newly formed nations. And Britain and France's point of view is really just a way to keep being imperialist. Um, but more on that later. Um, but Turkey itself, right in the heart of Asia Minor, um, is going to resist being carved up by the, by the Allies. 
uh, Kemal Ataturk, who was, um, or actually given name Mustafa Kemal, was um, a general of the Ottoman Empire, and he basically organizes a resistance movement. And after two years in 1923, Turkey, uh, again, right in the middle of Asia Minor there, is going to be preserved. Uh, we're going to see the end of the Ottoman Sultanate. Um, and you're going to see Turkey really sort of try to evolve into a, a Western secular country, meaning a non-religious type government. Um, and, and Ataturk, he, he's kind of given the name Ataturk, means father of the Turks. He, he's really going to be credited for turning uh, the Turks in a new direction, uh, in a direction that sort of seeks to ally itself more with Europe than perhaps with the Middle East. Um, although that does change over the course of the 20th century, um, the, the, the creation of modern Turkey certainly does represent the end of a long traditional line starting with the Ottomans and the 1000s common era, uh, sort of comes to an end in 1923 and we see a modern nation state in Turkey established. And then there's this last thing here, this other major event, uh, the Russian Revolution. Russian defeats in battle contributed to a de rising demand for the overthrow of the Tsar. The Tsar was the Russian king, uh, and he had become extraordinarily unpopular uh, by 1917, uh, largely because he was seen as inept and incapable of um, running the Russian nation and certainly overseeing the, the war against Germany, which repeatedly um, demonstrated to the Russians that they were ill-equipped to compete um, with Germany militarily or economically. So widespread po poverty in Russia led to the establishment of a democratic government in the spring of 1917, the overthrow of the Tsar. And then eventually the democratic government is going to become so unpopular that it will be overthrown uh, by the communists at that time known as the Bolsheviks. We start talking about the Russian Revolution when we talk about World War I, mostly because the Russian Revolution actually started uh, while World War I was going on. Um, a big part of the reason had to do with the leadership of Tsar Nicholas II. Uh, another part of it had to do with, uh, really, the, the, the unbelievable poverty that existed in the country. Most people were desperately poor. Uh, and they desired some kind of a political change. So over the next couple of slides, we're just going to talk about some of the major causes uh, for the Russian Revolution um, that ultimately began in 1917. Uh, Long-term causes here, we see Tsarist rule, which again has a lot to do with the leadership of Tsar Nicholas II. People weren't happy about it. Peasant unrest, meaning there was just a lot of uneasiness on the part of the very poor, uh, and in that sense we mean poor agricultural workers or poor farmers. Uh, the problems of the urban workers, meaning people who worked in the cities, uh, were undergoing a lot of the same kinds of issues that uh, many industrializing countries were going through. Um, diversity and nationalism, that basically means that the Russian Empire was a large multinational empire that contained different groups of people, different ethnicities, different religions, different languages, uh, and it was difficult to govern all of those different people uh, under one, under the, the mantle of one country. So we'll see that nationalism uh, plays a major uh, plays a major role in the causes of the Russian Revolution. Um, the Russian Revolution happened in 1917, but it was actually preceded by an earlier political movement that occurred in 1905. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And really, again, the 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 ultimate cause here had to be World War One. The, the, the drubbing that the Russian army was receiving at the hands of the Germans was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. It was just too much for uh, many people to deal with um, after having fought and died uh, for three years uh, from 1914 to 1917. So ultimately it's going to be World War One that really pushes the nation into revolution. Starting off here, Tsarist rule. So, you know, in the previous unit, we talked a little bit about Tsar Alexander, who tried to uh, reform and change uh, the Russian economy a little bit. 
Um, but realistically, what had happened throughout the 1800s in Russia was that the government had stood in the ways of the progress of the Russian Revolution. So that means, oh, excuse me, it stood in the way uh, in the progress of the French Revolution. And what I mean by that is that ideas associated with democracy and equality and equality before the law and things of that nature um, really were were the opposite of what many of the uh, no, what the noble family of Russia, the Romanovs, um, wanted. Um, and in a lot of cases, it was the opposite of what the aristocratic families besides the Romanovs wanted. So in other words, the nobles. Um, the nobles had a lot to lose in Russia during the 1800s, so they did everything they could to block the ideas of the French Revolution. Certain people... Uh, wanted reform and they wanted a constitution that sort of mirrored what was happening in Western Europe. Um, but the czars had a long tradition of using a secret police force to suppress reform and, and to silence uh, liberal people who called for democratic change. Um, but eventually it is going to be um, really the what is perceived increasingly as the heavy hand of the czars uh, over people's lives that's going to help inspire the revolution of 1917. Uh, rigid social class system that existed at the start of World War One. that means, uh, for all intents and purposes, Russia in 1917 was very much a feudal society, a society um, with very clear social distinctions between rich people and poor people, uh, and it was extremely difficult um, to, to be upwardly mobile, in other words, be born as a peasant and move your way up. Um, and the reason for that was the domination of society by the czar and the aristocrats or the nobles. And the peasants had a very difficult um, situation to deal with. They were too poor to buy land. They didn't have enough to feed their families. Uh, industrialization itself was changing the nature of farming in Russia um, because of new mechanical devices, the need for a, an agricultural class to uh, was no longer as large. In other words, what you know, when we talked about the Industrial Revolution, what, what previously had to be done by ten farmers, now it was only necessary to be done by one or two. So that leaves eight farmers without work. So, and ultimately, even for the farmers who do have work, you're going to see um, a fall, a, a, a dropping in prices, because when there's more, you know, basic, basic economic principles, when there's more of something in circulation, the price for it goes down and so that means farmers are going to make less money for the same work now we talked about the industrial revolution in unit two and really that's what some people were experiencing even as late as you know 1917 when this revolution started the urban the people who worked in cities had the same kinds of industrial problems that many Europeans faced in the 1800s. They worked for long hours, low pay, they lived in slums, they were exposed to poverty and disease. And it's really going to be the ideas of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels that are going to speak to these people, these socialist ideas. Remember, when we talked about communism and the rise of uh, the ideas of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in the Communist Manifesto of 1848, that book where they sort of laid out the ideas of communism, Marx said that ultimately communism will arise in a nation that has work, a working class that is downtrodden. And remember what socialism and or communism means. It's, it, it means to uh, sort of level the playing field for everybody, to get rid of class, uh, a class system or any form of social stratification. So nobody has too much or too little that all the resources of the country are basically utilized to make sure that everybody gets enough to survive. And those kind of ideas really appealed to the urban workers, and it's going to be a big reason why they supported the Bolsheviks, or the Communists, uh, later in the Russian Revolution of 1917. Now, we talked about um, Austria-Hungary. And the Ottoman Empire breaking up uh, at the end of World War One as a result of the diversity and nationalism piece. And Russia was really no different in that regard. Uh, it was a very vast and diverse empire. Um, lots of different ethnic groups living within it. And in the 1800s, this was another idea we talked about in the previous unit, 
uh, in the 1800s, Russian czars tried to make all people in their empire think, act, and believe the same way as Russians. So for some, it meant to speak Russian when their native language might be Polish. For others, it might mean to practice Greek Orthodox Christianity when their religion might be Islam. Um, so the government of Russia had a, a long history of sort of trying to make non-Russians act and behave as Russians, which, as it turns out, is a terrible way to, to, to unify an empire. As a matter of fact, what it really does then is it tends to strengthen the resolve of the people um, who are being forced to, to think and act in different ways to actually uphold their own differences and, and be more proud of their own differences. And eventually that's going to be a reason for the Russian Revolution of 1917. Now we have this revolution in 1905 that occurred um, right at the beginning of the 20th century here. Um, it really, what it, what it had a lot to do with was the fact that people were desperately poor and they rose up in St. Petersburg and they basically surrounded um, they basically surrounded the the estate of the Czar. And this becomes a massive demonstration where uh, nobles land is seized and property is seized. Um, workers are going to engage in demonstrations and strikes. And in a very real way, in 1905, you see a situation kind of similar to France of 1789, um, particularly when it comes to the way the, the common people sort of took property from the nobles, really, to make a political statement, <coughs> uh, to say that they're not going to basically stand for it anymore. And as a result of this, Nicholas II does kind of agree to land some kind of limited reforms. And what that means is, instead of being a complete all-out absolute monarch, he agrees to uh, govern in accordance with an elected legislature. Uh, in England, we would call this legislature a parliament. In America, we'd call this legislature a congress. In Russia, the legislature's name is Duma. Okay. But, now, it wasn't really a truly democratic situation because only members of the aristocrat, uh, aristocratic groups could um, actually vote for the Duma's members, so it ensured basically that this representative um, uh, structure would only really make laws that benefit or at least uh, in, this, in some senses help the, the wealthy classes. So this was not a democratic structure in the sense that the poor were getting a voice in government. It was actually the furthest thing from it. The idea was that uh, Nicholas allowed for the creation of an elected legislature because that's what the people wanted. But in actual practice, uh, it turned out it was really just a tool for the nobility to uh, sort of further their own power. And what we talked about uh, previous to this section of the presentation was World War I. You know, World War I started in the summer of 1914, and it, for the Russians, lasted until 1917. Um, ultimately, it's going to be <coughs> the second group, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but ultimately it'll be the second group uh, that takes control in Russia during the fall um, of 1917 that'll pull the nation out of World War I. Um, Again, Germany had basically destroyed the Russian army on the Eastern Front um, and made the situation completely um, untenable for Russia. Russian industry couldn't produce the needed weapons and supplies. Matter of fact, by, by the end of this thing, Russian troops were being trained to go into battle uh, with broomsticks instead of rifles because there simply weren't enough rifles to go around to, to equip the army. So... And again, as was the case in many other countries during World War I, food supplies were strictly rationed so that the soldiers in the front would get the majority of the food to make sure that the, the nation's defense was fed. Um, but what that wound up doing was it ensured that there was going to be massive starvation on the home front in Russia because Russian, Russian agriculture, Russian industry couldn't really handle the, uh, the stresses of war as the, uh, the economies of Germany, Britain, uh, and France could. So 
World War One, I, I, I sometimes say, is like the straw that broke the camel's back. It's going to be the event that finally pushes um, the Russian people into open rebellion against their king, their czar, Nicholas II. So there it is, the Russian Revolution of 1917. Right now we're going to start talking about uh, some of the actual events of the revolution. We will meet Mr. Um, Mr. Lenin, and we will talk a little bit about uh, the Russian Civil War, and then we're going to get a look at Joseph Stalin as well. Excuse me. So, the beginning. Worker-led fruit riots. Ultimately, what happens here is, just like in 1905, there's a general uprising throughout the country in the spring of 1917. Um, and what Nicholas does to get to try to get control over the situation is he orders the soldiers out to basically calm down the countryside. You know, the, the rioters uh, need to basically be brought under control by the army. But what happens is the soldiers refuse to fire on the striking workers. Um, they do so because they see that they actually have more in common with the striking workers than they do with the king himself. They figure, why will we shoot these people who are starving just like I am? So, Nicholas understands, as does most of the aristocratic class, that without the support of the armed forces and the army, um, that Nicholas was basically powerless. So he's going to abdicate the throne, or abdicate means to give up the throne. Uh, after this, um, these food riots that occur at the beginning or the spring of 1917. Um, it's at that point that the leadership <coughs> excuse me, of the Duma, remember that Congress that was established in 1905, they're going to step up and now declare Russia as a democratic republic. And this is sort of hailed as the beginning of Russian democracy and elections are held so that the Duma becomes more representative in nature. Uh, no longer just a tool of the aristocratic classes, but more of a democratic organ. The, the big problem, though, with these Democrats here, the leaders of the Duma, is that they refuse to entertain the idea of pulling Russia out of World War I. What the, ma what the majority of the people of Russia wanted in the spring of 1917 was peace, land, and bread. They wanted the end of the hostilities, they wanted a piece of land to work for the families, and they wanted enough to eat. Um, and there was none of those things in the spring of 1914. Russia was still at war, um, people didn't have enough to eat, and they certainly didn't have land that belonged to them. So the big problem, the big mistake the leaders of the Duma make is they refuse to take the country out of World War I. This makes them extremely unpopular in the eyes of the public, and it's going to usher in the possibility of a second revolution, a revolution that will claim to give the people what they truly want, and that is that peace, land, and bread. And here it is, the Bolsheviks take power. There's Lenin on the right there. Um, the word Bolshevik actually means majority, and in and of itself, the name is actually a piece of propaganda because the Bolsheviks never really made up the majority of people in Russia. But Vladimir Lenin was a brilliant revolutionary who understood um, that perception was really everything. And um, by calling his political group the majority, which is what the word literally translates to, people felt that they were joining into something that reflected what most people wanted. And he promises the people what they want. He promises peace, land, and bread. We're going to end the war. You're going to have enough to eat, and you'll have a piece of land to work so that you're, you and your family can survive. Um, the, the Bolsheviks are going to seize power over the, the Democratic-led Duma uh, in the fall of 1917. This is the October-November Revolution. And really what happens is throughout the countryside in Russia... Worker-led councils who refer to themselves as Soviets are basically just going to say, okay, we now control this town. Uh, and these are groups of workers that get together uh, and ultimately just say, now we are the leaders of, of Russia. Um, and Russia is going to become the world's first self-avowed communist nation. Uh, and from really this point forward, from this point, 1917 until 1991, we're not going to call it Russia anymore. It's going to be the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. 
the USSR, or the Soviet Union. <coughs> In this section here, we're going to get a look at Lenin um, and some of the changes that he made um, to change the nature of the Russian economy. Um, and we're going to take a look at it's almost like he was learning on the job towards the end um, with his new economic policy. Now, for Lenin to take control in Russia, he was going to have to modify what Marx originally said. Remember, Marx said that for a while there's going to have to be a dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, and what Marx meant by that was a dictatorship of the working class. Now, Lenin kind of looked at the situation in Russia and said, well, the working class doesn't know how to run a country. I do. So he basically puts out this idea that he will be a temporary dictator because the workers couldn't be trusted to know their own interest. Um, and this is, this is a bit of an adaptation of what Marx had originally envisioned. Marx said that the workers need to basically take over the country, take over the, uh, the means of production, that means all of the factories, and start distributing goods and services to people as they need them. And then and only then will people, will tr pe will people truly be equal. Um, so that's not really possible in Russia as Lenin pictures it. Realistically, it's not really possible anywhere. Um, so Lenin does what, in his opinion, is the next best thing. He declares himself a dictator um, and promises to dole out goods and services to people as they need them. Uh, and his way of doing this is by nationalizing the major industries. And that means that all the railroads, all the factories, any business that performs any kind of useful work or function is going to be taken over and run by the government for the purpose of producing whatever that industry was originally intended to produce so that the, the, those produced goods or services can be distributed to the public um, because they need them. In other words, you know, when we talked about communism in Unit 2, we said that if a factory produces hats, now the factory is going to produce hats not to sell the hats and make money because communists are against capitalism. The factory is going to produce hats because people need hats for their head to stay warm. That's basically the idea here, and it, it transfers to every industry. Um, so railroads. Railroads are, are not going to be owned by private entrepreneurs to make a profit. Railroads are going to be um, run by the government because people need transportation. Houses are going to be built not by private people trying to sell and make money. Houses are going to be produced by the government because the government wants to ensure that people have places to live. Clothing, same thing. Clothing will be produced by the government because people need clothing to live. Everything, food, services, the military, every single thing is going to be, is going to be controlled by the government. In, in, and the idea is to produce enough for the people to survive by taking the profit motive out of the equation. Now, this doesn't really go very smoothly here. Uh, there's a lot of people in Russia who are not Bolsheviks. Even though the Bolsheviks call themselves the majority, they were actually not the mi majority. Um, there were a lot of people who were actually against the Bolsheviks, and, and these people could be former members of the Duma, meaning people who were democratic in nature. Um, it could be people who had formerly supported the Tsar and his family. Um, so there was really a lot of groups that were against this communist takeover. So for a couple of years following the revolution of 1917, we're going to see a civil war in Russia. Basically, Russia is going to divide into two camps. Uh, those who support Lenin are going to be known as the Reds. So people, supporters of Lenin are the communists. And then people who oppose Lenin are known as the Whites. And this, again, this could be democratic people, uh, people with royalist, <coughs> excuse me, royalist sympathies uh, and others. Um, the outside world was not blind to what was going on in Russia in the early 1920s. Um, and realistically, to the outside world, the idea of a communist takeover in Russia was a, was a really bad proposition. If, they, if communism takes over Russia, that means Russia will no longer be a trading partner 
for countries like the United States, Britain, Japan, um, and that's a problem. So, from at least from an economic standpoint, because again, communism's not about trade, or it's not supposed to be about trade, and we'll see that that kind of changes a little bit. But um, by definition, a communist economy is an economy that seeks to um, support its people by giving them what they need, not by um, you know being run for the profit motive. So, foreign po powers are actually going to get involved here and assist the whites, and that means. Uh, supporters of the Romanov family and even um, Democrats. So the United States, Germany, well, not so much Germany, but the United States, Britain, Japan, they're all going to send soldiers to fight on behalf of the white army uh, to try to destroy the communist movement in Russia. Um, at this time, we're also going to see parts of the old Russian Empire going to break away. This is that nationalism piece. So they're going to so certain groups throughout Russia are going to see their opportunity to sort of break away from the Russian Empire, and that Red Army, which is the army of the communists, is going to wind up being successful. This is the victory that's going to secure the power of the new communist government, um, and it's really going to um, be one of the major reasons why the communists sort of are able to consolidate their power because over the course of this civil war, the communists are, are going to sort of wipe out many of their enemies. Now, it's interesting that by 1920, Lenin realizes that communism as an economic policy, as an economic system, doesn't really work. And a big reason for that is that, well, look at the second point I have listed there. Peasants weren't growing enough food, right? Because the idea is, in communism, you grow the food, and the government seizes it and distributes it equally amongst the people, so everybody has enough to eat. You don't grow the food in order to sell it in a market so that you make money. That's, that's the opposite idea of communism. So, human nature dictates, if you're not going to get paid for your labor, you're not going to do the labor. And, and eventually, that's what winds up happening. Peasants don't grow the food because they're afraid it's just going to be taken by the government and they're going to be left with nothing. So what do they have for, you know, a hard day or a hard week or a hard month's work at the end of it? They certainly don't have any money because they're not allowed to sell it in a market. Um, they have a promise that their needs will be supplied by other community members. Um, and that's not really enough, unfortunately. So Lenin... Lenin's not a fool. He realizes this. He sees that the, the economic system is not working. So he institutes what he calls the new economic policy. Um, and what it is, it's kind of 180 degree <coughs> backtracking on what he and Marx and everybody else who believed in communism basically said the economic system was going to be all about. He basically says... As long as you turn over a certain portion of what you grow to the government, you can keep some of it to sell in in a market. Basically, the peasants now, if they grow 100% of their crop, if they turn over 50% of it or so to the government so that it can be distributed amongst the people, the other 50% can be sold uh, in a market for the profit motive. It's sort of an admission by Lenin here that communist economic thinking doesn't really work. Um, <clears throat> the government is going to retain control in major industries like the railroads and things like that, but it is an admission on the part of the head communist here that communist economic policy doesn't really work and that changes were needed. Now, that's unfortunate for everybody involved. Not that Lenin was a saint, because he certainly wasn't, but... His death in 1924, which happened suddenly, is going to launch a struggle for power that ends with the rise of Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin is one of the top three monsters of the 20th century. You put Stalin on the same pedestal as Hitler and probably Mao Zedong, uh, as people who are responsible for the death of millions and millions of people. Um, just to get an idea here as to the major differences between Lenin and Stalin, I made a little T-chart. Again, Lenin led from the beginning of the revolution until his sudden death in 1924. He was trying to create that classless society that Marx had written about in the Communist Manifesto of 1848. Um, he does wind up allowing some private business with the institution of that new economic policy in 19, uh, 1920. Um, 
And for a little while, that was actually working. The standard of living went up. Some peasants were able to hold land. Um, in general, the economy was improving. But with Lenin's death, suddenly in 1924, we see the rise of Joseph Stalin, who really emerges. He's not really, he's not the head leader of Russia until later, until 1927 or so, but he emerges from a power struggle between himself, another guy named Trotsky, another guy named Bakunin, and a number of people. And, and eventually what happens is Stalin murders them all in one way or another, or at least uh, expels them all uh, from power. Uh, by using ruthless leadership tactics. Um, Stalin was not so much into the notion of a classless society. He was really interested in making Russia into a, or the Soviet Union into a modern industrial power um, that could compete with the West, that could compete with the likes of Britain and the United States. Um, and he's going to sort of undo some of the progress that had been made in the new economic policy He's going to get rid of all form of private ownership of anything. The government's going to run and control the economy. This is called a command economy where the government makes every economic decision in the country. It takes everything out of the hands of the private sector. Um, brings all agriculture under government control. That just means that basically people who had lived and worked on family farms for generations are going to be removed from those farms and strangers are under the employment of the government are going to be shipped in um families are going to be broken up and th th these group farms or or what what is referred to as farm collectives meaning just people are thrown together to work the land uh, as employees of the government, um, has that predictable result, that result that had occurred before the new economic policy where, you know, if you tell me to work, but you're telling me you're not going to pay me at the end of the week, guess what's going to happen? I'm not going to work very hard. The idea is that without the incentive of payment, people don't work. And what winds up happening is the standard of living is going to fall for the workers and peasants. There's going to be shortages of needed supplies and foods. There's going to be shortages, really, of everything, um, all because of this this notion of uh, the government trying to control everything. Now, we see a new word here, totalitarianism. It's defined as a modern political system in which government controls all aspects of individual life. Um, rights of free speech are going to be denied during Stalin's time. Now, Stalin was the head of the Soviet Union from 1927 or so until his death in 1953. And he, Stalin's going to do everything in his power to turn the Soviet Union into a totalitarian state where the government keeps a close eye on what its citizens do, who they associate with, what they're reading, what they're hearing, what they're seeing, every aspect of life is going to be sought to be controlled by Joseph Stalin and his government. And to do this, he's going to use the secret police. He's going to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, control education. Um, Joseph Stalin is actually going to go so far as to, he would personally edit the textbooks that school children would receive so that they don't come to learn things that Stalin doesn't want them to learn. Uh, and then by doing this, he was actually able to erase certain people from history. Um, people who had, uh, I told you earlier that he, he emerged in 1927 from a power struggle with somebody named Trotsky. Well, the name Trotsky was banned from the history book, so people never learned that there was an alternative version of what was going on to his. Um, so he was able to sort of wipe people out from existence. Um, it's kind of an interesting idea. Um, censorship, meaning the government's going to look at all forms of music and art and decide what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And really, when a totalitarian government does that, it judges material to be inappropriate when it threatens the power of the party, of the political system. Um, and that kind of threat can be seen in almost anything. So any form of free speech was subject to uh, censorship. Uh, during Stalin's time in the Soviet Union. So Stalin's going to make a number of changes after he comes to power. Um, we're going to see a, a period of terror, reign of terror, where he's going to get rid of his enemies. Farm collectivization, again, those peasants are going to be moved to the farms and they're, they're going to be told to work 
um, five-year plans, which are industrial goals, and this, this program of glorification of Stalin, which we'll take a look at. Now, the first thing Stalin had to do when he came to power was get rid of his enemies, get rid of people um, who had opinions other than his. So he had people arrested. Uh, he oversaw a series of purges, which means potential leaders who, who had opinions other than his were arrested and sent to gulags in Siberia. Many of them were simply executed or done away with secretly. Um, tens of millions of people died during Stalin's reigns of reign of terror here. Um, and all of it, really, the whole reason for, for all of it had everything to do with the consolidation of power. If you want to be a totalitarian leader, if you want to be a dictator, a total leader, uh, a total um, ruler, um, the one thing you can't have is dissent. The one thing you can't have is debate. So really what Stalin did through, through terror and through... Um, the use of the secret police was had anybody who dared speak against him destroyed so that ultimately what he surrounded himself with was a bunch of people who would simply tell him what he wanted to hear and do his bidding which is eventually what does happen now we talked about this a little bit earlier um private land is taken from the peasants who are going to be forced to join these collective farms owned by the government um, it's interesting because really what we're talking about here is in some cases, families who had owned a piece of farmland for many hundreds of years, who had been, been, had been passed down from generation to generation. Now they were shipped away because of the notion that they owned it. Remember in a communist system, you can't own anything. Nothing is for you. Nothing is for your profit. You, you work a piece of land so that the society as a whole benefits from your labor. Um, so the notion that a family could own a piece of land was uh, opposite of what Stalin and the communists wanted. So they had people shipped off the land and they shipped in different people to work the land, people who had no prior connection to the land. Uh, and in so doing, the idea was um, that these people will simply work the land so that the harvest feeds the masses. Um, there's a lot of resistance to this, obviously. If, you, if a piece of land had been in your family for generations and now you're being told to leave it and others are going to come and work on it, um, you're going to resist that. And that's exactly what happened in the Ukraine. Um, Ukraine had a, had a, uh, a nickname. It was kind of known as the breadbasket of Russia. Most of the food <coughs> for the Russian people came from that region. Um, many of the peasants rejected it. They refused to leave the land. They refused to farm the land because they knew the government would simply take uh, their harvests from them. So what Stalin does to make a ruthless example of, of the people of the Ukraine for not falling into line, he seizes their food supply, seals off the region, and basically quarantines them until they starve to death. Millions and millions of Ukrainians starved to death at the hands of Joseph Stalin here. And again, the point was to, to, to show the, the Russian people, and probably the world, um, you don't trifle with the power of Joseph Stalin. You will fall into line or you will fall. It's as simple as that. Um, so millions of Ukrainians are going to starve to death as a result of the collectivization policies and... Um, Unfortunately, that's only the beginning. Now, we said earlier that the the Russian or the Soviet economy, in communist theory, a command economy is about the government making every economic decision. You see, in a market-based economy, something like what you see in the United States, private entrepreneurs start a business because they're trying to meet a demand that they see. You start a business to sell hats because people want hats, okay? Um, the idea is to make as many hats as you can and to sell them to as many people as want them. But you would never start the business if you didn't foresee a demand for the hats, okay? Um, you know, if you want to start a business making purple raincoats, you do it because purple is particularly popular that year. Maybe next year pink is popular or black, and then you, you change what you're producing to meet what is a perceived demand. Um, the command economy doesn't work that way at all. 
uh, instead of letting the market sort of work out what's going to be produced, the government looks at the country and says, well, we need this much of this, this much of that, and that's what we're going to produce. So that's what Stalin essentially puts into effect after 1928 is a series of five-year plans where with it, the idea is within five years, we will produce this, let's say, 20,000 tons of steel because steel is important to build bridges and we need bridges. Um, whether there was any actual demand for bridges from the Russian people is unknown, but because the government of the Soviet Union and Joseph Stalin perceived a need to build something, they build it. Um, so <coughs> all the resources of the country are going to go in to produce whatever the government sees fit to produce for whatever reason. Uh, now, Stalin, because he was very interested in power, you're going to see heavy industry developed. And heavy industry means railroads, transportation systems, and weapons. You're going to see tremendous amounts of weapons built in Soviet Russia. Um, because, again, the government saw that there was a need for that. Um, not necessarily... So, again, so really what, what happens here is a lot of consumer needs are going to be ignored because the government simply isn't in tune what every single person wants or even needs. And as a result, many mistakes are going to be made. You know, a group of economic planners sitting in Moscow um, cannot possibly envision or understand what the entire nation needs, particularly during this period, before computers, before um, instantaneous communication, things like that. There was no way a group of bureaucrats sitting in an office in Moscow could um, foresee, well, we're going to need this tonnage of food within five years. We're going to need this amount of um, train cars or locomotives. We're going to need this, that, the other thing. They can't possibly. So what actually happens is a lot of mistakes are made. Um, a lot of shortages occur, meaning goods and services that are needed uh, are not going to be provided because it's simply impossible to... Uh, to anticipate, and, and therein lies a major problem. Uh, a lot of how a natural market economy works is, you know, goods and services are provided because a demand arises, and certain entrepreneurs even anticipate what is going to be in demand. You know, in the late 1970s, Bill Gates developed, you know, developed IBM because he was in, in anticipation of a boom in computers in the 1980s and 90s. As it turned out for Bill Gates, the entrepreneur, that certainly uh, worked out for him. Um, there was no way a group of bureaucrats sitting in an office could possibly anticipate all the needs that people would have in the future. So that's another limitation here of the five-year plans. The world five years from now is going to be very different. So how can we possibly plan what we're going to need five years from now? Now, this last thing here is the glorification of Stalin. Um, you see the propaganda poster on the right here. There's a picture of Joseph Stalin looking down on a crowd of frenzied and, and happy onlookers. The, Stalin is pictured here as almost a fatherly figure looking out for the well-being of his healthy, um, you know, his healthy uh, citizens here who, who seem to love him. Um, and that's how Stalin wanted to be perceived. He wanted to be perceived as Russia's greatest leader ever. Cities are going to be named at, at, after him, most notably Stalingrad, site of a very important World War II battle. You're going to see pictures of Stalin appearing everywhere. Uh, statues will portray him as a gentle fatherly ruler. Children are going to memorize his sayings in school. And again, nothing really could be further from the truth. Stal Joseph Stalin was a murderous monster who had an agenda only for himself. And his economic system was deeply, deeply flawed. But when you control education and you control um, information... Uh, you can make people think what you want to think. And Joseph Stalin was absolutely a master at, um, you know, and this is one thing I suppose he shared with Vladimir Lenin. He was definitely a master of perception. How you're perceived uh, is every bit as much imp uh, as important as what you actually do. Um, and Stalin understood how um, to present himself to the people. So... That kind of wraps up Unit 4. Now, keep in mind, we talked about a number of things in this unit. We talked about World War One, 
the causes of it, the effects of it. Um, we talked about specifically as far as the results of World War One are concerned, the Treaty of Versailles and the breakup of large multinational empires like the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And now we also talked about the Russian Revolution, <coughs> excuse me, of 1917. Um, we talked about the causes and the effects of that. We talked a little bit about Lenin um, during his time in power from 1917 until his death in 1924. And then we talked about really the changes made under Joseph Stalin after the death of Lenin. Um, and we talked about the really the transition of the Soviet Union from uh, a communist state to really quite a, a totalitarian state under Stalin. Um, and the interesting thing really about Stalin is just how long he, uh, he, he survived and how long he governed or ruled uh, Russia. He, you know, he didn't relinquish control of Russia until his death in 1953. So it's going to be Joseph Stalin who sort of pilots the Soviet Union through World War II. Uh, it's going to be Joseph Stalin who makes backdoor deals with Adolf Hitler. It's going to be Joseph Stalin who really puts the people uh, of the Soviet Union in a difficult position uh, for the for the ensuing 20 years, uh, really 20 years or so from uh, his rise in the mid 20s until his death in 1953. That would be 30 years or so. Okay, um, until next time, enjoy, study, and I will see you in unit five.